Um, so yeah, so welcome uh, to Dr. Nadine El Anani. Nadine is an English legal scholar. She's a senior lecturer in law and director of the Center of Research on Race and Law at Birkbeck University in London. She specializes in migration and refugee law, European Union law, protest and criminal law. And she is a friend of Kat and always comes and brings amazing knowledge to the space. So welcome Nadine. Um, and I'd like to invite you to set the landscape and give us some context for your readings tonight. Thanks, Sienna. Thanks for everyone um, for coming today. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about um, uh, the current context, but in relation to um, the arguments that I make in my book, which, I, I, as you will, will know, I set a couple of chapters um, from that as, as, as part of the reading for, for today. Um, so I'm going to look at, think about um, it, uh, Britain's migration law in the context of its colonial history. Um, and try to relate that a bit to um, the militarization, the question of militarization of borders um, and some of the rhetoric that we've been hearing in recent um, um, days. And then I will also just briefly introduce uh, some of the other readings that um, hopefully you've had a chance to look at for today. So if Britain's colonial history and that of its recent imperial invasions were to be put front and center in our analysis of migration and its control, Britain would not be understood as a legitimately bordered sovereign nation state but as an active colonial space in which racialized people in and outside its borders continue to be made subject to the most brutal forms of state racial terror. In Britain, the post-Brexit political landscape is particularly hostile to migrants or anyone perceived to be a migrant. In recent years, with authoritarianism on the rise and increasing executive power, we've seen growing and insistent calls for military intervention to address a wide range of perceived social problems. In March 2019, then UK Defence Secretary Gavin Williamson said, the UK armed forces stand ready to intervene in the knife crime epidemic. A year later, at the outset of an actual epidemic, the Daily Express reported that up to 20,000 military personnel are being put on standby in a new COVID support force that could backfill police counter-terrorism roles, act as prison guards, or help with border force checks. And now we have Priti Patel, calling on the military to deal with a small number of boats bringing people seeking refuge to Britain. Last week, we saw the Home Office request the Ministry of Defence deploy Navy vessels in the Dover Straits. Patel also appointed a former Royal Marine to the role of clandestine channel threat commander. The army is habitually called on to defend the nation in times of existential crisis. It is assumed to have a special ability to distinguish between full citizens and hidden enemies. The army promises to be among the last institutions to know who is the us that deserves protection and who requires exclusion, expulsion or incarceration. The call for an authoritarian response is a rejection of human rights and the varied procedural protections of civil society. For all the rhetoric of choice in the neoliberal economic and social system, the call for authoritarianism as a solution is revealing of the fear that there are no meaningful or effective social agents or collective outlets for action. Something of course we know is wrong when we look at the recent Black Lives Matter uprising. At the same time, the discourse we are reading and hearing daily from officials about so-called illegal migrants who in the words of immigration minister, Chris Filk, should face real consequences for seeking to travel to Britain across the channel, obscures the historical context for the movement of racialized people to Britain today, erasing the relevance of Britain's imperial history and more, and more recent imperial invasions which produce migratory movements. This erasure also constructs colonial spoils located in Britain, broadly defined, as being the exclusive possession of white British people. In reality, Britain is an ongoing colonial space in which its colonial colonially derived possessions are guarded and withheld from the people who they were stolen from in the course of centuries of colonialism and dispossession. Britain would not be the wealthy, plentiful place that it is without its colonial history. Colonialism and slavery were key to its industrialization and the growth of its capitalist economy. In 1833, Britain abolished slavery only to raise the equivalent of 17 billion in compensation to be paid to British slave owners for the loss of their property. The compensation scheme was the largest state-sponsored payout in British history until it was superseded by the bank bailouts of 2008. The funds paid out built and infused Britain's commercial, cultural, imperial and political institutions, 
wealth derived from British slave ownership has by no means been evenly distributed in Britain. It has helped to enrich and sustain elite institutions, individuals and families, and has sown inequality deep into the fabric of British society, helping to make it the most unequal place in Europe. Yet Britain's healthcare system, its welfare state, transportation infrastructure, cultural and educational institutions, battered and unequally accessible as they are in the wake of privatization and austerity policies, are colonially derived, along with, of course, the private wealth amassed over the course of the British Empire and retained after its defeat via systems of inheritance. Britain's borders and their enforcement through immigration laws have their origins in British colonialism. The 1960s, 70s and 80s are particularly important decades in the story of the making of bonded Britain. As colonial populations fought the British from their territories, British lawmakers fast abandoned the myth of imperial unity and equality and moved to introduce controls targeted at racialized colonial subjects and Commonwealth citizens. As the British Empire was defeated, successive British governments introduced immigration controls, withdrawing the rights of racialized Commonwealth citizens and British colonial subjects to enter the British mainland. It did so via the legal concept of patriality, introduced in the 1971 Immigration Act, which stipulated that only those born in Britain or with a parent born in Britain had a right of entry and stay, and thereby made whiteness intrinsic to British identity. In 1971, a person born in Britain was 98% likely to be white. The act thus prevented the vast majority of racialized colonial, former, colonial and former colonial subjects from traveling to and settling in Britain. The 1981 British Nationality Act continued this process of racial exclusion by constructing British citizenship on the foundation of the 1971 Act's concept of patriality, tying citizenship to the right of entry and abode. It raised for the first time the spectre of a post-imperial, territorially defined and circumscribed Britain. It severed a notionally white, ge geographically distinct Britain from the remainder of its colonies and Commonwealth. This move was both materially and symbolically significant. A territorially distinct Britain and a concept of citizenship that made Britishness commensurate with whiteness made it clear that Britain, the landmass and everything within it, belongs to Britons understood intrinsically as being white. So the 1981 Act didn't signify an end to British colonialism, but was itself a colonial maneuver. It was an act of appropriation, a final seizure of the wealth and infrastructure secured through centuries of colonial conquest. The effect of the 1981 Act, along with changes to immigration law, was to put the wealth that Britain gained via colonial conquest out of reach for the vast majority of people racialized through colonial processes most of whom with geographical or ancestral histories of British colonialism. Immigration law not only serves as the means of obstruction of movement, but also the means through which legal status is granted. While critiques of recognition are well established in settler colonial studies, the same critique has not been made in relation to Britain. Regimes of legal status recognition, whereby British authorities determine according to the law entitlement to statuses, whether we're talking about citizenship, settlement, indefinite leave to remain, or refugee status, serve to legitimize the claim that colonial wealth, as it manifests in Britain, belongs behind its borders only to be accessed with permission. Similar to the way in which indigenous people in Canada and Australia must submit to the rules and evidentiary standards of those colonial legal systems in order to be recognized as having enforceable rights to land that was stolen from them, those with ancestral geograph geographical and personal histories of British colonialism who wish to access stolen colonial wealth and resources in Britain have to submit to the rules and evidentiary standards of British immigration law. Um, so in this way, there's, there's a facade of racial inclusion that's built through the law in, these, in this form of paths to legal status recognition, which dole out immigration statuses to select racialized people who can fulfill certain criteria. Such recognition is always on the terms of the colonial state. Meanwhile, the vast majority of racialized people are prevented from accessing Britain and its wealth through the operation of internal and external borders. The traditional acceptance of legal categories as defined in international and domestic law in and outside academia has the effect of concealing law's role in producing racialized subjects and racial violence. 
It also prevents us understanding that law is itself racial violence. If you take, for example, the category of the refugee, which is relatively valorized as compared with the irregularized migrant, individuals falling outside the legal definition of a refugee are often described as illegal, irregular, or economic migrants, um, and are at risk of being removed and denied access to healthcare, housing, and work. A decision to deny legal status carries serious, sometimes fatal consequences and can be a politically expedient move on the part of a government seeking to um, dole out degrees of belonging, entitlement and exclusion among populations under its control. Addressing the historical contingency and artificiality of legal categories, the violence in their production and the ongoing effects allows us to understand how Britain remains colonially and racially configured. It also helps us to think about how we might reject a more liberal politics of recognition and open the way for us to develop our thinking around emancipatory and reparative courses and strategy, discourses and strategies for migrant solidarity and racial justice. Legal status doesn't alter the way in which racialized people are cast in white spaces as undeserving guests, outsiders or intruders, as here today, but always potentially gone tomorrow. Immigration law is, after all, the prop used to teach white British citizens that what Britain plundered from its colonies is theirs and theirs alone. Immigration law is not, therefore, the seemingly harsh but fair mode through which the deserving are separated from the undeserving. Instead, it's a crucial mechanism for ensuring that colonial wealth remains out of the hands of those from whom it was stolen. Understanding that immigration law is an extension of colonialism enables us to question Britain's claim to being a legitimately bordered sovereign nation state. If we as critical scholars and activists can imbibe a counter pedagogy to that of immigration law and bordering, with one which rejects the violence of legal categorization and paves the way for a more empowering, redistributive and radical politics of racial justice, we can begin to work our way towards new strategies for organizing collectively in the service of anti-racism and migrant solidarity. So the reading that I suggested um, from my book, The Introduction in Chapter 5, um, sets out the argument which I've just, which I've just made um, in essence and hopefully helps us to develop our own means um, and language for challenging the discourse that we're seeing reproduced right now in the media and by officials um, that Britain is the sovereign nation state that has a right to police its borders and prevent racialized people from accessing resources within. Um, and so, as, as I've argued, um, Britain itself comprises the spoils of empire, and I, and I define spoils of empire broadly, so not just thinking about um, what might be in the British Museum, for instance, but thinking about the spoils of empire as including things like access to health, access to welfare, access to housing, access to clean air, um, access to um, all, all the basic means of life and other opportunities and things that we, that we take for granted um, uh, uh, in Britain today. Um, and I also make the argument um, that irregularized migration should actually be understood as anti-colonial resistance in the sense that we can, um, we can use the language of, of, of irregularized migration being anti-colonial res resistance as a way of rejecting um, some of what we, um, some of the discourses we hear around um, using the language of invasion um, and, that's, and that sort of um, language that we've been hearing um, in, recent, in recent days. And then chapter five um, shows that the European Union is also an ongoing imperial project in the way that, that Britain is formed by former colonial powers who are desirous to protect and pool the wealth that they gained in the course of um, colonial context. And indeed, um, this chapter provides the necessary historical context for the piece by Nordentoft, um, um, Mose and Wright, which describes how the EU border space has been increasingly militarized and theorizes um, the racializing and deadly effects um, of border violence at the EU. And it shows us that, of course, what the, the militarized um, action that Britain um, wants to take right now in making the channel an unviable route to Britain is something that actually the European Union um, and Britain, of course, as a member state and a very supportive member state of the EU border space, the policing of the EU border space, um, for instance, by the EU border agency um, called Frontex. It's something that European Union has been doing for a very long time in the Mediterranean. Um, and that's the sort of thing that, that Britain wants to, wants to do um, now. Um, 
And then, of course, the, the report, um, the Border Wars report, investigates the European Union's investment of public funds uh, in the military um, uh, and security companies that provide the equipment to border guards, the surveillance technology um, to police borders and the technological infrastructure um, to track people's movement. Um, so, yeah, that's it from, from me by way of introduction. <laughs>